Hello, everyone. I'm Kathleen Cooling, Vice President of the St. Helena Historical Society. I'm joining you tonight from our new Heritage Center on Oak Avenue in St. Helena. The Heritage Center is open to the public every Saturday afternoon from noon to 4 p.m., so stop by and visit us. We're offering this lecture series free to everyone, but we do need your support to continue enhance and enhance the series. So after the lecture, please go to our website and click the red donate button. And thank you all for your continuing support. I need to remind everyone that they should be on mute now and need to stay on mute until the Q&A session after the lecture. After the lecture, you can unmute yourself to ask a question, or if you prefer, you can activate the little chat button on the bottom of your screen and type in a question. Um, we're recording this presentation and the Q&A tonight so we can post it on our new YouTube channel. And the title of the channel, channel is St. Helena Historical Society Lecture Series. So welcome everyone to our March lecture in the 2022 Suzanne Salvestrin Memorial Lecture Series. Tonight, I'm sitting in our farming exhibit in the museum. You may notice that one of the vintage photos right over my shoulder here is on display in this exhibit. And it is of the York family who were an early farming family. One of their descendants, Ms. Beth Clark is our speaker tonight. Beth has researched the extended York family and she's authored a book titled St. Helena Roots, The Palmers, Thompsons and Yorks and the Families They Join. This is a copy of this book and it's just a substantial and filled with all kinds of maps and photos and it's fully indexed, it's a really nice book. There are several copies that are still available for sale and you can, um, you can order one of those books if you wish by contacting the St. Helena Historical Society and you can email us at this email address. I don't know if you can read this, but it is shstory at shstory.org and you can just email us and ask for a copy of that book. <clears throat> The title of Beth's talk tonight is The York Family and Their Descendants in Napa Valley. Beth, you should be able to start your screen share now for the presentation and we'll make sure it's set up correctly. Okay, so I'm gonna put it on uh, and start the slides. Okay. Okay, uh, people can see it, I assume? Yes. Okay, well, welcome everybody and thanks for having me. Um, I started um, researching uh, the Yorks and the Thompsons and, and the Palmers about six years ago, I guess. My, my father had started doing a little research. My, my mother grew up in, um, in St. Helena. She was a Thompson. Um, so anyway, uh, so I spent two and a half years doing some research and ended up writing a book. So, um, so I'm gonna share some of the information that, that I found. There's quite a lot of information about the Yorks and the Palmers and the Thompsons and, and other families that um, were in St. Helena. Um, we're just gonna actually just kind of talk about the, the, a little bit of, of what I found tonight. So um, I wanted to talk about John and Lucinda Hudson York. They were the first Yorks coming to Napa Valley. And that's really, um, uh, I, I would say that's, those are the stories that are the most um, famous in my family. Um, we'll talk about John York's family, where they came from. I mean, everybody coming to the Valley came from somewhere else. Um, we'll talk about uh, their journey coming to Napa Valley and some what life was like for these early, early settlers. And then I want to talk about how the York family tree expanded. Um, not all the people in the York family have the, the last name York at this point. 
And I also wanted to talk about the contributions to, to the Napa Valley that, that the Yorks and their extended family members have made. So before we get started, I just wanted to give a shout out to the women. They were really the unsung heroines. Um, there's not a lot written about them. I had a hard time finding information about them. Um, most of the women until recent times were the traditional housewives and they weren't out in society accomplishing the historically significant things like the men did, but they certainly were very important. Um, they raised large families. Some of these um, families were 10, 12 or more children. Um, and they kept their houses going without the conveniences of today. Um, so they were behind the scenes supporting the men and helping them build our cities. So I just wanted to, I grabbed some pictures of some of the, the women just to give them uh, some um, uh, notice here in the presentation. So I think you can see my, um, my pointer here. So this is Lucinda Hudson York. So she was the first of the family, first woman of the family to come to Napa Valley. Her daughter, Nancy York McCormick. Um, this is her son, Dean, and he married Frances Mills. Um, this is their daughter, Clara. Um, and their great granddaughter, Margaret York Fagiani, um, who was the daughter of this, this son, John Tony York. And uh, this is my grandmother, um, who was a Palmer, uh, Esther Palmer Thompson, and she was a great granddaughter of Lucinda. So John and Lucinda Hudson York were, were pioneers in, in this valley. Uh, they came to uh, Napa Valley uh, um, in 1845 uh, with their two children. Um, they were actually the first Yorks in California as well. And they came from Missouri. And John was 25 at the time and Lucinda was 22. And Lucinda's brothers, David and William Hudson came with them on the trip. So they're said to be among the first white people in the Santa, in the Santa Elena area. And certainly all, all these, the, the Hudson brothers and Lucinda and, and John were pioneers. So I think it's interesting to look back uh, at these families. Obviously, if uh, a York hadn't come to America, there would be no John York coming to California. So John's line of Yorks have been traced back to 1470 in England. And it's in 1705, the first York came to America. He was 20 year old Jeremiah York the first. And he was from a poor family, so he probably came to America for better opportunities. Uh, it's likely he couldn't afford his passage. Uh, and in those days, it was common for young men to work in exchange for their passage. So it's likely he worked for about five to seven years in the Philadelphia area after he arrived. And in those days, the, these young men were not allowed to marry while they were working off their passage. So. He, he married probably later than he would have if he'd stayed in England. And he married twice eventually and had 10 children between, between his two wives. So initially he settled in West Nottingham, Carolina, North Carolina and his son Seymour Sr. was born there about 1727. So our John York who came to Napa Valley is descended through Seymour Sr. And this group of um, family members stayed, stayed together and moved around together. And they went to Maryland and Virginia and North Carolina and Tennessee. And our John York's grandfather, Seymour Jr. was born in 1763 in Randolph County, North Carolina. And also John's father, Enoch, was born there in 1790. So you can see a picture of John's parents, Enoch and Nancy Hill York here. So our John York was born June 15th, 1820 in Granger County, Tennessee. He was one of 10 children. And he grew up in Hines Valley, Tennessee, uh, where his father Enoch had an 85 acre farm. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the families pretty much stayed together 
So Enoch's farm was near the farm of John's grandfather, Seymour York Jr. Uh, in 1840, John's parents and five of their children moved from Warren County, Tennessee to DeKalb County, Alabama. Uh, but John and his sister Jane and her husband didn't go with them. They moved to Dade County, Missouri instead. So the two families, two parts of the family were 550 miles apart on today's roads. Uh, and John bought a farm there in Dade County and he stayed there until 1845. Um, so Jane and her husband and family, they stayed in Dade County. Um, um, and John's parents also, they stayed in, uh, in DeKalb County, Alabama. So John met Lucinda Hudson in Dade County and they married on September 5th, 1841. So their first son, William Enoch, who's better known as Dean, uh, was born in Missouri in 1843. So in May of 1845, John and Lucinda and Lucinda's brothers, Dave and William Hudson formed a wagon train in Missouri with about 40 other wagons. There were about a hundred people on that trip. So their son, Dean was two years old at the time. So John Grigsby was elected captain of the wagon train. And as you're doing research about um, the different residents in the Napa Valley, you may come across his name. Um, he settled uh, south of Yontville. So they headed west along the Oregon Trail which is in this blue line here. Uh, and then in Idaho, in, they decided that instead of going to the Oregon territory up here, that they would uh, go to California instead. So it was a dangerous and arduous trip. So there were not a lot of people who had gone um, to California before. And the trappers and the others who came back from, from the West didn't talk about the hardships and the realities that, that these uh, travelers would encounter. Instead, they told stories about free land, riches, and opportunities. So there were a lot of unknowns about the trip itself uh, and what the travelers would find on the other end. So the wagons trade, traveled together in a wagon train for protection and also because they needed to work together to overcome obstacles along the way. So about a third of the travelers died on these trips um, and Lucinda gave birth to twins on the trail and only one twin survived. When I uh, learned that she had been pregnant with twins um, and going on this trip, I kind of wondered why, um, why they didn't wait until she was not pregnant because of the very difficult trip. Um, but you had to go on a wagon train. You couldn't go as a single wagon. And in reality, she was pregnant every two or three years for about 20 years. So there wouldn't have been much opportunity. So why would they go on such a dangerous journey? Well, some of the theories that I came across was, well, they wanted a better life. So these stories of free land, new opportunities, uh, those were all pretty enticing. Not necessarily true, but enticing. So they were trying to escape from the epidemics that were raging like TB and cholera. Um, but I did find some death certificates um, of some of the members of the York family who died of TB. So Clearly some of these disease, diseases followed them. And in the 1840s, uh, those who supported the Southern ideals were becoming uneasy because there was a growing movement in slavery. But they, these travelers left behind the security of family and friends and John left his entire family behind. I'm not sure if he'd ever seen them again. Um, so it wasn't such a sacrifice for Lucinda um, because two of her brothers came on the same trip um, and then two brothers came later. So it was very challenging going over the Sierras. Um, the Grigsby wagon train was the first to cross the Sierras into California. There weren't any trails except the trails that were used by the Indians. 
So the wagons had to be dismantled and ho hoisted over the Sierras. So this picture here uh, is, it's not the Grigsby wagon train. I found it with a story for, um, um, for some of the wagon trains going into Oregon, but I think it, it well represents um, what the task was that they had. And I wanted to read um, a section of a letter that David Hudson had written to H.H. Bancroft in 1872. So David said, and when we came to benches or rocks eight feet straight up and down, we would unyoke our oxen, drive them around to some low place, get them above the bench and again, yoke up the oxen. In the meantime, some of us would cut some long poles strong enough to bear up the wagons and lay them up on the rocks. Then take enough chains to reach back to the wagon, hitch back to the end of the tongue and pull the wagon up. In coming down the mountain, we frequently had to tie trees behind the wagons. Sometimes we let them down with ropes with a turn around the tree. On side hills, we tied ropes to the tops of the wagons and some men would walk above them and hold on to the ropes to keep them from turning over. So it's quite, a, quite an ordeal. So the journey from Missouri to Napa Valley took the travelers six months. Um, and so the Yorks and the Hudson brothers arrived in Hot Springs, now known as Calistoga on November 1st, 1845. As I mentioned, they were among the first white people in the area. So both John York and David Hudson built temporary cabins on property in Hot Springs that was owned by Dr. Edward Bale. And I will talk a little bit about Dr. Bale in a minute. So there is a historical marker, marker 682, that marks the site of John's cabin. Um, it's on the southwest corner of Highway 29 and Lincoln Avenue in Calistoga. So I, I actually found this. Um, it was back behind a big clump of bushes when I looked a few years ago. So, um, but it is there. Uh, the site of Hudson's cabin um, is also a historical um, landmark, but there isn't a plaque. And when I look for information about it up on the internet, I saw a picture of a gas station. So um, you're probably more familiar with, with what's on Lincoln Avenue than I am. So one of the things that I like to do when I'm researching these families is try and imagine what life was like when they were living. And we're lucky enough to have um, some stories from John York's grandson, Rodney McCormick. And so I wanted to read a few um, pieces from his stories because he can certainly describe it much better than I can. So Rodney says, grandfather often described Napa Valley in the early days as being park-like in its beauty, wild oaks, oats as high as a horse, great forests of giant valley oak, streams full of fish and game everywhere, elk, grizzly bear, California lion, deer, and small game. The cattle that roamed the valley were introduced and owned by people of Spanish descent, descent whom, whom grandfather described as generous to a fault and kind and considerate toward the early American settlers. One could kill a beef from their herd without permit, keep the meat, hang up the tallow and hide for the owner and everyone would be satisfied. So um, in Rodney's stories, he, he talks about some of their encounters with the grizzly bears and the mountain lions, it's quite entertaining. And I did include those um, stories in, in um, my book. So Rodney also uh, talked about um, Lucinda meeting um, some of the Indians. And he says, Indians of Napa County numbered in the thousands in the very early days until the white man came with his diseases, which almost wiped out the natives. Grandmother tells of about 300 naked Indians calling at the house in 1846, wanting to see a white child. They had two children at the time, Dave born in the Humboldt sink in Nevada and Dean born in Missouri. 
The Indians passed the babies around and looked them over with great interest, them being the first white children they had ever seen. Being alone at the time, she was greatly alarmed, but curiosity was the sole motivation of the Indians. So John York and David Hudson are both well known as um, members of the Bear Flag Party, the term Bear Flaggers. So when the Yorks and the Hudsons arrived in Napa Valley, uh, Mexico owned California. And so John and David became part of the Bear Flag Party, which was a group of about 30 men whose goal was to make California part of the US. So they weren't aware at the time that President Polk had declared war on Mexico. Uh, Polk had wanted to buy California and New Mexico, but, didn't, uh, but Mexico didn't want to sell. So Polk, Polk declared war. So on June 14th, 1846, the Bear Flaggers invaded Sonoma and they took General Vallejo as a prisoner of war. And they raised a bear flag to declare California as part of the US. And what was ironic was that General Vallejo actually was, uh, was in favor of, of the Californian, of California going to, um, to the US. So um, uh, he actually, it was a kind of a bloodless war in, uh, in Sonoma at least. So during this short war with Mexico, that was around this time, John York and Sam Kelsey carried the American flag from Sonoma to Sacramento and they delivered it to Captain Sutter at his fort. So I included here a picture of uh, this, what is supposed to be this early um, bear flag that was ra raised in Sonoma. And one of our family stories is that Lucinda's petticoats were used to make the bear flag. Uh, and in fact, one of her obituaries says that she frequently mentioned this. Whether this is actually true, I, I don't know. I, I did some research on this flag and found several different stories that, that uh, talked about different people contributing their clothing for this flag. So, but anyway, it's a great story for us. So I wanted to talk about John York, the landowner and, um, so our current John York and Sandy York and I did some research um, tracking back John's um, uh, lands as much as we could, could find from the deeds. Um, and so um, according to grandson Rodney, um, uh, John York er owned land as early as 1848. We didn't actually find deeds that, um, that early, but it's possible. So John York and David Hudson uh, acquired the land that's now St. Helena and from a series of purchases from a Dr. Uh, Edward Bale and his widow. Um, so Dr. Bale was an English physician and uh, he married a, a woman named Maria Ignacia Suberanis in 1839. So at the time you had to be a Mexican citizen to own land. Um, and so he became a Mexican citizen in 1841. And at that point he was given a Mexican land grant of almost 18,000 acres uh, between Rutherford and Calistoga. So over the years, um, he and his wife ended up selling off uh, property and also um, using it to, um, fulfill some debts. So he died in 1849. So according to grandson Rodney, uh, in 1848, John built a six room house in St. Helena. And then there is a deed that shows that in 1857, John bought 300 acres of land from David Hudson that, da that David had gotten from Bale's widow. Um, and um, it's possible that he actually had the land via verbal agreement um, before that, um, but that's what the deed said, 1857. So then the boundaries for John's property with that 300 acres were um, at the northern end, northern end York Creek, uh, at the southern end Madrona Avenue, and at the eastern end Main Street, um, and then at the Western end, somewhere in the hills, we were not exactly sure. 
1857, John donated land with a log house on it for a schoolhouse. Um, so that land was just south of Beringer's Winery. Uh, and the house was then called the York Schoolhouse. Um, and it was later moved to downtown St. Helena. So one interesting thing about this to me was that um, uh, John signed his, all of his documents with an X, which I assume means he, he couldn't write and probably read, um, but it was nice to know that he supported education. So looking at their land over the years, in 1870, John completed an eight room Southern style house um, behind the current uh, Dean York Lane. Um, and you can see a picture of it here, see, right here. Um, and at that point, a six room house was rented out to a group of Chinese men who wanted to raise vegetables on, on that property. So after, uh, thereafter, the property was referred to as the China Garden. So over the years, John sold most of his property or had it seized to pay off his debts. Um, so in 1890, his land was gone except for his homestead of 37 acres. And then in 1905, which is the, uh, actually the year where Lucinda died, um, John sold that land to his six children uh, to be held in escrow until his death. Uh, and then John died in 1910. So John York was a farmer and actually most of the Yorks from the 1400s until the early 1900s were farmers. So he was following the family business. Uh, in the first few years of farming in the Valley, he raised cattle primarily. And in 1860, he began converting some of his land to vineyards. And by 1868, he had 35,000 vines. So some sources credit John with having planted the first wine grapes in Napa Valley, um, and other sources cre credit John Yon for being the first to do so. And they credit John Patchett for planting the first commercial vineyard in 1854. So as I mentioned, I like to um, get an idea of what life was like. So again, um, Thanks to Rodney McCormick, we, we have a, uh, some information about that. Um, and I wanted to read what, what Rodney had written. In the early days, they had to live, live off their farms. Roasted barley was used in the place of coffee. They always kept a large flock of chickens for home use. A number of cows were milked. Beef was butchered on the place and hung high in an oak tree near the house. Flies did not bother at the time. The, meas, the meat thus hung would keep two or three weeks in splendid condition out of doors. They always had a large vegetable garden, well fertilized and supplied with ample water. Watermelons and muskmelons were gathered for the Sunday feed that embraced the neighborhood. Often on Sundays, 40 to 50 people would enjoy the melons. Grandmother was rated as a famous cook. Both grandparents were kind, generous, and hospitable. And naturally, many people sampled their hospitality and grandmother's cooking. It was a good deal like a hotel, except no one ever paid a cent. So I've been watching this show on TV that's called Finding Your Roots. And, uh, and what they do is they, uh, they do research on the, on the family history of different celebrities. And one thing that I noticed is that um, they are always looking to see if um, some of the ancestors own slaves. And so I looked at that with these families also. And what I found was that John Lucinda, Lucinda's family and John's family, except for his brother Caswell, um, were strong Confederate sympathizers and, and they supported slavery. And grandson Rodney says, Lucinda always defended slavery and often quoted the Bible, servant, obey thy master. So as far as I could tell, no one in John's family, all the way back to his great grandfather at least, owned slaves. Um, but that was not the case for Lucinda. Um, her parents, 
uh, owned a large uh, farm in Missouri, um, and the 1840 census showed that that Lucinda's parents uh, had quite a few slaves. Uh, they died in 1840, and then their heirs, who I assume are the children, sold the slaves and divided the proceeds among themselves. So John's family was living in the South during the Civil War. Um, uh, I had to look up and see when the Civil War was. That's 1861 to 1865. And during the Civil War, one of John's brothers and also possibly his father served in the Southern Army. But John's brother Caswell served in the Northern Army. Uh, and that led to some long standing conflicts between Caswell and the other family members. So, uh, grandson Lowell Palmer um, had made a comment um, about. Um, his grandfather, and so I'm thinking that John's viewpoints about the South might not have been too popular in Napa Valley. So Lowell Palmer said, during the Civil War, a delegation of Union men from Napa set out for St. Helena to show Grandfather York the error of his thoughts and ways. Having received advance warning of this, he and a group of supporters met the delegation around the area of Yauntville confronted them and no more problems. So in 1897, John's brother Caswell had come, came to visit John in St. Helena. So they hadn't seen each other for 56 years, not since John left Missouri. Uh, you can see Caswell here. Um, and at that point, the Civil War had been over for 32 years. But John's family was concerned because the brothers had been on opposing sides during the war. So they made John promise to be civil to his brother. Uh, so John said if Caswell made any any bad comments about the South and the Civil War, then he would ask Caswell to leave. So the two brothers did fine for a week, but then things kind of fell apart. So grandson Rod Rodney wrote, the first that I knew of any trouble was when the brother's grip came out the door and he followed fast and kept on going. We never saw him again. So John and Lucinda had 11 children. Uh, five died as children or before they could have married. Um, and uh, so five boys and daughter Nancy Jane connected the York family tree um, to a number of St. Helena families. And you might, you might recognize some of these names. So Henry married a woman named Alice um, and uh, Fawcett was one of the names I came across for her, Cox, Warner were a couple others. John married um, Mary Spur, Peter married Catherine, Sophie Felice, Charles married um, Emma Falkenstein, Nancy Jean married William Newton McCormick, and Dean married Francis Mills. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about Henry, John, Peter, and Charles, and then, um, then more about Nancy Jane and, and Dean. Um, so Henry uh, was born in 1847, and he married this woman, Alice, between 1870 and 1880. So they did not have children together. Um, so the York line through Henry was stopped at that point. Uh, so Henry was a night watchman and town marshal. And uh, yeah, we don't know too much more about him. Uh, John Alexander married, married uh, Livonia Spur in 1873. Um, so they had three children. So he was a butcher and he had a shop with a Spur relative. Um, and then he also had a mobile butcher shop with William McCormick, who was married to his sister, Nancy Jane. Uh, and as far as I can tell, there aren't any descendants left from this York line. And then Peter uh, was born in 1855. He married Catherine Sophie Felice between 1900 and 1903. So he was in his mid forties at the time and she was considerably younger, uh, but they had five children. So he was a farmhand, cemetery care caretaker and eventually the supervisor of the St. Helena Cemetery. 
And as we go on through the slides, you'll see a lot of the family members were involved with St. Alima Cemetery. So we know more about Charles uh, York, who was born in 1858. He was the eighth child. And he married Emma Falkenstein in December of 1891. Uh, so they had four children. So he was a superintendent of Charles Chevalier Vineyard um, on Spring Mountain, and he was a rancher most of his life. So they built a house in 1910 on Spring Mountain Road. And that was passed down through the family until 1999. So some of you may know some of Charles's descendants. Um, so at the 1945 family reunion, Charles was the only child of John and Lucinda who was still living then. And then uh, his daughter, Helen, uh, was the last grandchild of uh, John and Lucinda. And she, uh, she died in 1999. And there still are some of Charles' descendants in Napa Valley. So Nancy Jane York was the sixth child of John and Lucinda, and she married William Newton McCormick in 1870. So William was a butcher in St. Helena, um, but Nancy and William are best known as the managers of the White Sulphur Springs Resort. Uh, so Nancy, Jane, and William had eight children. Um, so their son Rodney is the one who, is, who wrote the stories. I included a picture of him here since we've been talking about him. Uh, so he was also postmaster in Napa and he had real estate business and um, some other um, different occupations along the way. Um, so I, I um, did not do a deep dive in uh, about the McCormicks um, because I'm, Betty McCormick Malgren has um, a lot of information about them. Um, but I did want to talk about the McCormicks and their contribution to the Valley because um, uh, I think that is a really important contribution from this family. Um, so the McCormick ancestors were traced back to Thomas McCormick in Ireland in, in the early 1700s. And he likely came to America before 1760. Um, and the first McCormicks came to St. Helena about 1844. So that was before the Yorks came. So the McCormick family owned a ranch in the valley for 175 years, and it was established in 1844 when William McCormick and his family began raising cattle and sheep there. Um, but at the time, Mexico still owned California, and you had to be um, uh, a Mexican citizen to own land, so the Mexican government soon forced them off to leave. Uh, and, um, but they returned in 1846 after the Bear Flag Revolt and when California became part of the US. Um, so I included this map here to give you a sense of where, where the ranch was here. Uh, here's St. Helena, here's Rutherford. Um, and uh, so it spans the ridge between Sonoma and Napa counties. Um, I'm not sure I know how to pronounce the name of these, these mountains, the Mayacamus Mountains, maybe. Um, so the land passed to William's son, Henry, who died in 1879. And then multiple generations of the McCormick women ran the ranch. So as far as we can tell, Nancy Jane and her husband, William, weren't directly involved with, um, with the ranch, but, um, but William was a butcher, so it makes sense to me that they had some sort of arrangement with the family ranch um, uh, to get cattle from there. So the, it was important to the McCormick's uh, conservation and being good land stewards. And to that end, um, the McCormick property is now gone for public use and just, um, a little bit about how that happened. So in 1975, fourth generation Babe McCormick and her daughter Sandra Leonard sold off a thousand acres to expand Sugar Sugarloaf Ridge State Park. So those 
acres are now known as the McCormick edition. And in 1987, Sandra and her new husband, Jim Perry, who I think I saw on, on this uh, um, uh, webinar, uh, formed a nonprofit organization called Acorn Soup. So its purpose was to teach children about the environment. And then in, um, in 2000, the Sonoma Land Trust bought the remaining 654 acre ranch. So I found um, on the, the Sonoma Trust uh, Land Trust website, um, this that said, the property expands Hood Mountain Park, expands ridge trails and wildlife linkage and builds resiliency to wildfire and climate changes. So I think this is just a wonderful contribution to the public. So I wanted to now go back and talk about Dean York, who was actually the first of John and Lucinda's children. Um, and I put him last just because I think the most family members are um, through this line uh, at this point. And so I wanted to dig down a little bit more into, into this line. So Dean was the first of John and Lucinda's children. Uh, he was born June 5th, um, 1843 in Independence, Missouri. So as I mentioned, he was two when his family began the trip west. And he married Frances Mills in 1867. So unlike the York family that went overland, the Mills family traveled from Illinois to San Francisco via Panama um, in the mid 1850s. So they came down uh, the Mississippi River on um, on a ship, and then they um, uh, they went across uh, the across Panama with the natives there carrying the children, and then they got on another ship and came to Saint Helena. I actually came to San Francisco. They came to Saint Helena in 1862. So Dean and Francis had five children, but only two of them survived past childhood: John Tony and Clara Josephine. Uh, so Francis died in 1922, and Dean remarried soon after um, to a family friend named uh, Ruth Cruy, but he then died in 1923, so it was a very short um, marriage. So this is one of my favorite family pictures because it covers four generations. So this is Dean here, I think you can see with my po pointer. And, and this is Francis, his wife. And this is Lucinda Hudson, Dean's mother. Um, and then in the front here is Charles Palmer who married um, Clara, uh, Dean and, and Francis's daughter, Clara. And she is holding their son, Edward Raymond. And next to them is their daughter, Esther, who is my grandmother. And next to um, Esther is her great grandfather, John York. So I want to talk a little bit about the house that Dean built. Um, so it was, uh, it's on Dean York Lane and it was completed in uh, 1880. Uh, it was built on land that um, Dean had purchased from his father, John. So it's been owned by family members since it was built. Um, and currently our, our current John York and Sandy York are the longest owners. Um, they've owned it since 1973 when they bought it from my grandmother's um, estate. And um, John and Sandy and I um, did a research about this, uh, this house that they now own. Um, I had pictures from my grandmother and uh, they had pictures from over the years. Uh, you can see um, that the house has changed. So this is 2015 and there's a, uh, a big extension on the house. This is when Dean owned it um, in, you know, from 1880 on through his life. And uh, so I did document the history of this house um, in my book. So like his, his father, Dean was a farmer um, and so carrying on the family business. 
Uh, so I, I just grabbed something from his uh, obituary that says for nearly 78 years, his home was in Napa Valley. And when St. Helena was incorporated, the town took in his farm. He never shirked the responsibility of citizenship, but did his part loyally and well. And as time went on, developed his farm into one of the finest vineyards and orchards hereabouts. And uh, so his nephew, Rodney, uh, wrote, Uncle Dean York's planting of five acres of prunes gave him an average annual gro gross return of around $1,000 per year for 30 years. So I was curious of what the equivalent would be in today's do dollars, and uh, $1,000 in 1910 is about the equivalent of $30,000 in today's money. So here's an old bale maker on the Dean York Ranch. So with Dean and Francis's um, two adult uh, children, um, the family expanded some more. So John Tony married Lena Keg, and Clara Josephine married Charles Palmer. So our current John York is descended through John Tony and Lena Keg, um, and Clara Josephine married, um, and Clara Josephine and Charles Palmer are, that's the line I'm descended from. So a uh, little about, about this line of the family. So John Tony was born in 1869. So he was the second child of Dean and Francis. And he married Lena Keg in 1904. So uh, Lena's parents were born on the island of Man in England. Um, and Lena's father immigrated to America in 1866 and her mother in 1871. So compared to some other family members, they were kind of late coming to the Valley. So John Tony became a lawyer in 1892. Uh, and in the 1920s, he served as the Napa city attorney uh, and he died in 1928. So, um, uh, so they had four children. So Margaret married Andrew Fagiani, um, John W. didn't marry. Daniel K. married Alice Ridgewell, and uh, David R. married, uh, I actually have to, uh, sorry, I got a little mixed up here. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm... I have forgotten the name of Bernice Sperling, I believe is the name of David R's um, wife. So starting with John Tony's family, uh, so farming was no longer the de facto, de facto York family occupation. Now the family had lawyers. Um, and at the time when John Tony graduated, uh, law was mostly a man's field. And at that point, actually, it was for quite a while after that. Um, in 1891, I, I was checking to see um, how many women had graduated from the uh, Hastings Law School where John Tony graduated. Um, and only eight out of the 74 graduates um, at that school were women at the time. And then I looked to see um, the history of the women in the American Bar Association. And it wasn't until 1918 that the first two women were admitted into the American Bar Association. So John Tony and Lena Sun, John W., Daniel K., and David R. all followed their father's footsteps and became attorneys. And then David's daughters, Jane, Nancy, and Ellen, broke the glass ceiling of a profession dominated by men and they became attorneys. So I see Ellen uh, is on here too. So uh, I think it's great, Ellen. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the contributions of uh, some of the individuals um, in the family. And uh, these are the ones with uh, the last name York. So we talked about John uh, quite a bit, the Bear Flag Party and deeding land to the school. He also established the St. Helena Water Company with water from the York Creek. 
Uh, his son, Dean, was St. Helena Town trustee for 11 years, also involved with the St. Helena Cemetery Association. Uh, John's son, Henry, was St. Helena Town Marshal. His son, Peter, was supervisor of the St. Helena Cemetery. Um, and then Dean's son, John Tony, was Napa City Attorney. Uh, John Tony's son, Daniel Kay, was Napa District Attorney during World War II, Napa City DA and City Council uh, for 29 years total. Uh, David R. was Napa County DA and St. Helena St. Helena Justice Court Judge and our current John W. was St. Helena Planning Commission. Um, so I was thinking back to, um, uh, you know, when uh, looking back in history, if John York had not come to the Valley, um, all of these contributions that the family members had, had made uh, wouldn't, wouldn't have existed. So it's always nice to have kind of a go-to place to see something about families. Uh, so this is the York House in Napa. And uh, John and Tony, John Tony and Lena bought this house in 1910. And it was owned by the York family until 1985. And this house has quite a his history to it um, that is, um, uh, on the internet, if you're interested, I, I also talked about it some in my book. So there were a lot of gatherings of the York family in this house. Uh, so it's now an office building and not open to the public, but my sister and I walked around um, and it's quite interesting even looking from the outside. So the Palmers, uh, Palmer line joined the York family tree with um, Claire Josephine. So she was the first uh, child of Dean and Francis York, born in 1867. So she married Charles Palmer in 1892. And so they lived in Crockett initially, but um, by 1910, they had moved to St. Helena and they owned a, a house on Fur Hill Road until 1941. Uh, at that point, Charles sold, sold it to granddaughter Ruth Thompson Pagandarm. Some of you may know Pagandarms. Um, so John, uh, Charles had a number of jobs. He was flour mill employee, shipping clerk, machinist, fruit farmer, and rancher. I didn't get the sense that he was as much into ranching as some of the York family members were. So they had four children. So now we've added more families from St. Helena to the York family tree. And some of these might be um, familiar names to you. So Esther Francis married Orville Thompson. Those are my grandparents. Edward Raymond married Hattie Clendenin and Charles Lowell married Elsie Yenny. And their daughter Burnell um, died uh, as a young woman but before she actually was able to marry. So looking back quickly at the Palmer family roots. Um, so the first Palmers in the line came from England in 1829 and they settled mostly in Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, so the first Palmers who came to St. Helena were Edward and Delia Green Palmer. These were Charles's parents. Um, Charles, or Edward had moved from Ohio to Northern California in 1852. Uh, again, like the Mills family made the journey via Panama rather than come across the country on wagon train. And he married a woman named Delia Green. Uh, so eventually they ended up in Venetia. And then, um, and he was a miner uh, for about 12 years in Northern California. Um, and in 1882, uh, they bought the Alstrom Ranch at the west end of Madrona Avenue. Uh, and that was 111.2 acres plus other acreage um, uh, as well. So the Palmer line um, uh, it continued actually only through Clara and Charles's son, Edward Sr. Uh, because Lowell and wife Elsie, and he had only a girl. I shouldn't say only a girl. And Nancy was very important, but she couldn't carry on the family name. So uh, Nancy's marriage connected um, the tree to the Morgans then. Um, 
So Edward Sr. married Hattie Clennon in 1918. Uh, and so their three children expanded the York family tree further. So you may know um, some of these names. So Shirley married Bob Hunley. Uh, they live in Fairfield. You, you may know, know Shirley and Bob. Uh, Edward Raymond Jr. married uh, Mary Louise Volper and Ramona married George DeLong. And um, so today, um, Edward Jr.'s son, John, and his wife, Abigail, and their children are the only family members with the last name Palmer who are left in the York extended family tree. And they live in St. Helena. I'm sure some of you know John. So again, looking at contributions, these are public contributions. Certainly everybody in the family contribute. Um, so Edward Palmer Sr., he was the St. Helena city clerk for 25 years. He was supervisor of the St. Helena Waterworks and supervisor of the St. Helena Public Cemetery. And Charles Palmer, known as Lowell, uh, he was the St. Helena Deputy DA, St. Helena Justice Court Judge, and also involved with the St. Helena Public Cemetery. Uh, Edward, R Edward Palmer Jr., um, he was on the school board in St. Helena for 31 years, um, Margaret Farmer Worker Housing Committee, and the St. Helena Volunteer Fire Department. And our John Palmer, uh, who I'm sure a lot of you know from the Historical Society is also in the St. Helena Public Cemetery um, Board. So the Thompson line joined the York family tree with um, Charles and Clara Palmer's daughter, uh, Esther, my grand grandmother, and she married Orville Thompson in 1924. Um, and um, Orville's parents, Frank and Teresa Dixon Thompson had come to St. Helena from, from Wyoming uh, with their four children in 1906. So Orville was St. Helena assistant postmaster for 36 years. Um, and he also worked, worked the ranch that they had. Um, I, in the family boxes, I found some petitions um, uh, from St. Helena community members um, for making him postmaster in St. Helena, but apparently that never happened. So, um, so my grandparents uh, owned the Dean York Ranch uh, um, from 1943 to 1973. Um, and actually her brother Edward had owned it um, for the, during the 1930s as well until then. But when my grandmother got the property, it was 50 acres. Uh, but when, um, when the property was sold in um, 1973, it was down to one acre. So Esther and Orville had five children, um, further extending the York tree. So Phyllis, my mother married James Fidium, Ruth married Bruno Pagandarm, Philip married Aloha Samuels, Charles married Beverly Forney and Charles Landis and Barbara married Warren Young. So I just included a picture of, the, of my grandfather Orville at the 1941 St. Helena Post Office dedication. So again, looking at the public contributions of family members, we talked about my, my grandfather Orville as assistant postmaster he was also the Nap in the Napa County Farm Bureau and director of the Napa County Soil Conservation District and also another, uh, another family member with the St. Helena Cemetery Association. And then I'm sure that all of you are um, familiar with Mike Thompson, who among his other accomplishments has been California State Senator and is a US Congressman. And I saw on Mike's website that his sons are also in public service, one a firefighter and one a deputy sheriff. So I just wanted to end with uh, a thank you for your attention. And uh, I, I included some pictures from our 2011 uh, family reunion. We had um, one cake with the York crest and one with the Palmer crest. 
And then this is um, a picture of the descendants of uh, John York, who were at the uh, 1996 um, Bear Flag Sesquicentennial, um, where they took pictures of the descendants of each of the, the men in the Bear Flag Party. You're, you're on, on mute, Kathleen. Okay, thank you very much. What a well, what an entertaining and in-depth um, lecture. And it's just a, a piece of, of this work that you've accomplished in the book. I mean, you've really done a deep dive into your family. I admire that, congratulations. Um, I think we have a couple of questions on the chat and we also have a little time. It's uh, eight o'clock, but I think we have a little time for a few questions. Um, one question on the chat is, has been already answered. One uh, person wanted to know if Congressman Mike Thompson was a member of the Thompson family and you answered that one. Um, she also asked in the 80s, there was a cafe on St. Helena's Main Street called Palmer's. Was it named after the Palmer family, if you know anyone? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Um, someone who lives in, in St. Helena may know the answer to that. Okay, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Anyone else know the answer to Palmer's Cafe? Uh, it was not. Okay. I knew I could count on you, Miriam. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions tonight? Uh, I have one. Um, Beth, you, you mentioned that the uh, Hudson's and the Yorks and the Griggs and Guide Party were the first to come across the Sierra. I thought that uh, Joseph Childs came in 1841. Well, uh, that's the information that, that I came across. Um, one of the things I've discovered doing the research is that depending on what sources you look at, you may get um, different information. And so that's something I definitely will, will look at and see. That was, I can't remember off the top of my head, the source that I um, got that from, um, but I will look at that. Yeah, I just finished reading a book um, about the Across the Plains to California that year by year tells who um, came across the plains and who the members of the party were. So that's why it's just sort of in the front of my head. Yeah, I mean, it, it could very well be. Um, and yeah, I'll definitely look. I try to document sources um, in my book um, because very often different sources are conflicting. And so, um, you know, so I, I can look back and see where I might have gotten that information. Now you mentioned the Alstrom Ranch. Um, you know, uh, the Alstroms had White Silver Springs. Is this was se separate from White Silver Springs? You know, that information actually came from you about the Alstrom Ranch. When I first started um, researching, you had had just finished researching um, uh, Edward Palmer, and so that information came from you. Yeah. Okay. I forgot about that. <laughs> Must be right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Hello, uh, never know. Go ahead. Uh, this is Jim Perry, um, McCormick Ranch. And I'd just like to make a couple corrections on uh, what was talked about about our ranch. Um, the dates are kind of mixed up. In 2000 is when uh, Babe and Sandra made a contribution to the open space district for the thousand acres. And uh, the Learned Perry family still owns the McCormick Ranch, but we're in escrow with Sonoma Land Trust. And hopefully it will close here around the end of the year or so. So just make that change, we'd be accurate. So you said 2000. That's correct. Yeah. You know, I got the information from um, the trust website, I think. So um, the trust website might not be correct then too. 
uh, the yeah the property has not closed with the Sonoma Land Trust yet. It's still in escrow. Oh, okay. So that's the six hundred and fifty four acres. Any other comments or questions? I wanted to say one thing. Can you hear me? Yes. Jane? Um, I think some of the confusion about the different wagon trains coming was that they came in different routes. And so there were very various parties that crossed in different places. So they may have been the first at one place, but the third over whatever. And, it's my recollection from reading, there's an organization called Trails West um, that documents all of the different wag wagon trains that we were the second over the particular route that is just north of old Highway 40. And there's actually a marker if you walk from, uh, along the Pacific Crest Trail just north of where old Highway 40 uh, goes over uh, Donner, the real Donner summit. And there's a marker put by what trails west where you can still see the wagon routes of the of the wagon train that the Yorks were on. It has the dates of it. And I think if my cousin John York's on here, he can correct me, but I think it was the Grigsby Ides Murphy party, something like that was the name of it because there was an old guy who was leading it and he'd, he'd led that wagon train the year before over a very similar route. That's my, what I recall from those sources. And I've been to that marker, it's pretty neat. It sounds uh, very interesting, <laughs> yeah. You see, all the way, you see all the way down to Donner Lake from, from where the marker is, you can see where the route was um, up that, uh, that whole hillside to the top. Yes, that trip must have been breathtaking. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have a question on the chat room. And after that, I think we will close for the night. Um, Eric Gibbony, I hope I've got that right. He asked if, um, Beth, he asked if you have come across Gibbony or Walters in your research of early pioneers, either of those names? No, I haven't. Uh, so how are they related to the Yorks? Um, he does not say. Eric, if you're on, you could unmute yourself and... Yeah, I've never found a connection to the Yorks, but definitely to Grigsby. There was a connection between Gibbony, Walter, Sue Marriage, and then uh, Grigsby. So that's why I couldn't help but wonder if that if any of those three names had popped up anymore during her route. And some of the uh, timetables of the uh, wagon train certainly tie into some of my history. So I was just curious to see if she had encountered that. Uh, no, no, I haven't. And I just, uh, I just printed something out about Grigsby. Um, they gave a little history about him, but, but I hadn't really, you know, looked in depth as to um, his family or his, his connections. Thank you. So again, thank you to our speaker, Beth. And um, we've had another entertaining evening. Um, stay tuned for the next presentation at our May 1 annual membership meeting, which will be held in person here at the Heritage okay. Center. And that's going to be on May 1 in the afternoon. After that, our next lecture in the series will be on the Bracero program. Uh, the Bracero program was the program which enabled um, Mexican citizens to come to California, to St. Helena, and help in the fields while the um, local men had gone off to World War II. So that is going to be an interesting evening um, in person again at the Heritage Center. And our presenter for that lecture will be Rosario Segura. And we're looking forward to seeing you at upcoming events. But for now, good night, everybody. And thank you again to the speaker and to the audience. Good night. <laughs>